thinking about um, what I was going to talk about today, consistent with the theme of the conference, I went back and, uh, and I revisited what for me was one of my first crises. It was uh, one that I remember very vividly. It was a day uh, like today, uh, like it was this morning, but about 15 degrees colder. And it was opening day for the St. Joe High School Indians baseball team. And we were playing over in the port, about 25 miles from South Bend. Uh, it, it was windy like today. There was about 40 knots of wind coming off of Lake Michigan, raining, cold. Um, and this is my first game uh, and my big chance. And I didn't have a great day. I, uh, I went over for four, I struck out twice and grounded back to the pitcher twice. Uh, and I made four errors, I swear to God. Uh, every way a second baseman can make an error, uh, I did it. Uh, the game ends, we get beat, uh, I'm on the bus, and I know that my career uh, is over. Uh, got home that night, I walked in, my dad was sitting there with a, with a cold beer, and he said, uh, how'd you do? And I said, well, we got beat, eight to one. He said, well, how did you do it? And so I told him. And he said, well, I just had one piece of advice for you. That now you were ever there. <laughs> uh, and, and that proved to be good advice for someone who spent 17 years as an elected official. And, uh, <laughs> but was one of my first brushes with crisis. Uh, and at least that was one way to, to, to be able to deal with that. Um, Bob Carey, former senator and governor of Nebraska, uh, got some huskers over here, uh, and uh, a good friend uh, was Navy. He was a Navy SEAL and got the Congressional Medal of Honor um, in Vietnam. And Bob always used to say, well, you know the difference between a fairy tale and a war story. A fairy tale starts out once upon a time. And a war story starts out, no shit, this is really true. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to stick to the facts today uh, as best I can. And, and uh, just share with you again uh, a couple of thoughts and then open it up for for questions and discussion. Um, Admiral Ritzkopf, who was here uh, earlier this morning, uh, in the little blurb that is in your program, uh, he said that crises uh, come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, that that's exactly true. Uh, it, it is, uh, it's sleeping late, uh, missing a test, uh, it is trying to figure out uh, what kinds of decisions you have to make in terms of personnel, whether you're going to hire someone, whether you're going to fire someone, depending on circumstances. Uh, for me, uh, it was taking over uh, when uh, the governor of our state uh, had a stroke and then passed away. Uh, it was uh, getting shot down uh, over North Vietnam, spending uh, almost 11 months uh, in, in jail. Uh, and we find ways, it, it seems, in one way or another, to be able to deal with those kinds of things. And I think the panel discussion uh, that uh, I sat in for, uh, for part of this morning uh, was, uh, was a terrific uh, way to, to begin to think about that, certainly focused on those things that uh, really many of them are global in nature in terms of the kinds of responses that are necessary. Uh, but it, at the end of the day, I think it all does come back um, to leadership um, and recognizing as well that leadership comes in, uh, in all shapes and sizes. Uh, that while there are some things that are uh, fundamental and, and foundational, um, we are all different. And it, it, it's the difficulty of defining it has something to do with that. Uh, but I think it's safe to say for all of us um, that we know it when we see it. And 
and in that, I think there are lessons uh, for all of us. Uh, crises, uh, uh, the conference says uh, crises and uh, transforming crisis into opportunities. Crisis, um, crises actually are opportunities. Um, they are presenting themselves in some way, in, uh, in many cases unexpected ways, in others uh, ways that we can anticipate them do a little bit more planning for them. Uh, but, but they are opportunities for demonstrating leadership, being able to deal them. We deal with a crisis effectively, uh, but being able to do your best, uh, and at the same time, uh, surround yourself with the kind of people uh, that are going to help uh, to fulfill the mission. Um, we are all, uh, I think, the, the sum of our experiences. And we, when we look at, again, what I believe is fundamental, and that is preparation, um, it, it is from those experiences that we grow, uh, and from the crises, small and large, that we've had, uh, from the things that we study and the, the, the things that we, uh, that we pay attention to, and learning lessons uh, from mistakes that have been made in the past or from things that have been handled, been handled very well. Uh, those are the circumstances within which you really get uh, down to the guts uh, of whether uh, you're going to take those lessons uh, and learn them in such a way that you can then, uh, that you can then uh, apply them. Uh, there are, as I said, I think a couple of fundamentals and some of them were discussed this morning. Uh, but I think uh, leadership uh, first requires a good example. It means being, uh, being there early in the morning. It means, means being there late at night, uh, whatever it takes. Uh, it means doing the things that you said you would do um, when you said you would do them. Um, it is setting an example by the actions that you take. Uh, and I think that those speak louder than anything else. Uh, my uh, favorite example uh, is Admiral Kent Hewitt whether anyone's heard of Admiral Hewitt or not. But in November of 1942, uh, he set sail uh, from Norfolk uh, with 100 ships in a convoy, 35,000 uh, infantry, uh, mostly army, uh, with all of the material that they needed uh, for a landing on the coast of Morocco in, in West Africa. It, it was our invasion uh, of Africa, uh, coupled with uh, the British uh, going into the northern parts uh, of Africa. Um, he sailed south uh, down towards the coast of South America, uh, and then began his cross of the Atlantic, zigzagging all the way, uh, went through some terrible thunderstorms and gales uh, along the way, uh, in radio silence uh, all the way across. Um, and he arrived at the exact place where he was supposed to be um, without losing uh, a ship, without losing anyone aboard a ship, uh, eight minutes early. Now, this was, uh, nobody had GPS. Uh, they're sailing in, uh, in radio silence, cloudy days, uh, cloudy nights. Um, and this guy, known is, will not be a surprise, for his navigational skills, uh, arrived eight minutes early exactly where he was supposed to be. Um, and again, would not surprise you that he was also involved in the same role in, in the landings uh, uh, in, uh, at Italy, in Italy, uh, as well uh, as on D-Day. Um, he did what he said he was going to do, and he arrived when he said uh, he, he would. I think it is from performance um, that those people that work with you um, in whatever capacity um, end up with respect uh, for you. Uh, they can see what you have done. They see the kind of person that you are. Uh, and I think that respect, uh, again, was mentioned this morning. Uh, is, being, is being very important. And I, a big part of that, to me, 
um, is that you've got to be genuine. You have to be who you are. If you try to be someone else, uh, you're going to lose the battle. People that come and contact you will recognize whether you're in the genuine article uh, or not. Uh, and I think that that is something that you have to maintain. Uh, use a style that is comfortable for you. Uh, lead in ways that are comfortable for you. Uh, but you have to be yourself, uh, or I think you are, uh, are going to be in trouble. Uh, trust uh, comes from respect. Uh, again, it was mentioned this morning but it is absolutely critical uh, to being able to provide uh, leadership, uh, again, in the many different ways that, uh, that there are. Um, and it is, I think, uh, first and foremost, the ability to surround yourself with people uh, that you trust, uh, that you respect, uh, that have set a good example. Uh, and leaders are not just officers. Uh, leaders come from the enlisted ranks, uh, leaders come from uh, all walks of life, uh, but the fact is that you are, uh, to quote uh, my father, um, you are only as good as your ball club, uh, and you need everyone uh, to be able to work uh, together, uh, to pull in one direction. Uh, no room for turf, no room for whining. Uh, it is how do we get this job done? How do we take the initiatives that are necessary? in order to do that. Uh, and I think from all of that comes inspiration. Uh, and that is the inspiration that is provided to others, and inspiration that you get uh, from others. Again, independent of what their particular role is, or what their particular station, or their rank is. Um, there are people that have that ability to be able to inspire, um, and that uh, is, uh, to me, the ultimate description uh, of, of leadership. Uh, we saw a little bit of it uh, last night, uh, certainly not in a military context, but if you watch Peyton Manning uh, and being a Colts fan, uh, I watched uh, every bit of the game. Uh, but here they were, they're, they're behind by 11 points, it's the end of the first half. Uh, they were getting thumped pretty good, and he was, uh, had been knocked down a couple of times. And uh, there was no panic, uh, as has been the case with these guys all year long. Uh, they pulled together, they talked about where they had to adjust, where they had to adapt to make changes uh, in, in order to be successful. Uh, and everybody pulled together, everybody did their jobs, did their piece. Um, you had a rookie, two rookie receivers that uh, ended up really being the difference in the ball game. The defense stepped up, uh, and the inspiration I think comes from uh, Peyton Manning. But there are guys on that ball club uh, that have the same ability to be able to inspire. Um, and as a result of that, uh, they end up winning the ball game, uh, and they're going to beat the Saints in, in two weeks. Um, um, the, uh, uh, I, I think that so much of this, so much of uh, being able to do those things and uh, initiate the fundamentals uh, have a great deal to do with, uh, with just a couple of different things. One is that it's important that you learn, uh, and in order to learn, you have to listen. Uh, uh, and in doing so, uh, you end up uh, as one way of being able to, to acquire the skills that you need to be able to move forward. The kind of training that you go through, uh, what you have gone through uh, from the time you were pleased to uh, those of you that are getting ready to get out of school, uh, I know that there were days where you're saying, what the hell are we doing this for? Uh, everything that you have done is preparing for you for what, uh, for what comes ahead. Uh, the courses you, that you've taken, uh, uh, making sure that your brass is polished, that your gig line's straight, that you, um, that you work together as a team, all of those things uh, are building toward um, what lies ahead for you. Uh, on the 7th of May of 1972, um, I was flying uh, a 
along with Ron Polfer as a backseat and vigilantes, um, carrier based reconnaissance aircraft. Um, we were going to take pictures, bomb damage assessment of a target that an Alpha Strike 33 aircraft in the Kitty Hawk um, had just hit. And uh, bring the pictures back, and a decision would be made as to whether we were going to uh, have to go back in again or not, uh, whether the target had been hit uh, and damaged sufficient. Uh, while uh, in our briefing, they said, well, listen, while you're in the neighborhood, why don't you guys continue down Highway 1, which is the main north-south drag in Vietnam. Uh, why don't you continue down Highway 1 and go to the San Juan Bridge um, and take pictures along that route and, and then come out. Uh, and the San Juan Bridge was not one of the safer places uh, in, in Vietnam to go. Um, we had, uh, at that point, had lost about 40 airplanes uh, at or around uh, the San Juan Bridge. And in the briefing, I remember uh, Ron Polfer saying, well, what do you guys want to see if we found the river overnight? Uh, but we coasted in, we took pictures of our target, we headed down the road, and we're about halfway to the bridge, and we got hit. Uh, we got hit in the tail. Uh, we were at 4,500 feet. Uh, we were doing 563 knots, uh, which is about 650 miles an hour. Uh, the nose pitched down violently. My stuff in the back seat went flying. Uh, we came out of that very quickly, and we turned to head for the water. Uh, I got on the radios, and I said, Flare 4 uh, has been hit. Uh, the only person that heard me say that was me. Uh, our radios were dead, uh, and I had, in front of me was my instrument panel, had no communication with the front seat, the ICS. Uh, our internal communications were not working either. I tried auxiliary channel, I tried the emergency channel, nothing was working. Uh, as we rolled out and rolled wings level to head for the water, which is where we wanted to go because we controlled the water, um, the nose pitched down uh, again uh, and we were pointed at the ground. Uh, my radar altimeter uh, was, uh, was having trouble keeping up but we were going through 3,200 feet, and I made the decision to get out of the airplane. Uh, and ejected. Uh, I don't remember the ejection. I remember the, cat, the cockpit filled up with light, uh, but uh, was knocked out because of the force of the ejection, um, and I woke up on the ground. Uh, and the only reason I'm standing here today uh, is because the decisions that I made were instinctual because of the training that I had had uh, prior to being in that circumstance. Uh, it was the quality of training that caused me uh, to follow my checklist uh, to do the things that I had to do uh, in order to be able to get out of the airplane. Uh, I, I think when you, uh, another characteristic that is of tremendous importance is attitude. Um, it's how you look at the world. A uh, young woman from Notre Dame, her name was Danielle Green. She was a basketball player. Scored over a thousand points at Notre Dame. She was a left-handed guard. She was terrific. Um, shortly after 9-11, Danielle decided that she was going to go into the Army. And ended up enlisting, <coughs> headed over uh, to Iraq. Uh, and a couple months after she was there, she was guarding a government building. And was on the roof of the building. And she got hit by a rock. The rocket tore off uh, her arm right at the elbow. Uh, she had all kinds of shrapnel and, and other damage on the left side of her body um, and ended up, obviously, uh, coming home. Uh, and I had a chance to be with her uh, about three months after she got home. She had the prosthesis. And, um, we were actually at a Notre Dame game uh, and uh, were there uh, to present the flag, the two of us. Um, on September 11th of 2004. And in talking with Danielle, she said, and she had a smile that you couldn't wipe off her face. And she said, you know, when this happened to me, I became an optimist. And that was demonstrated in the kind of recovery that she made, the way that she went about the recovery, 
the very painful kind of rehab that she had to go through. Uh, but she knew that it was necessary, and she knew, uh, because she kept everything in perspective, uh, that she was very, very fortunate uh, to be there at all. Um, and in uh, your attitude, and in Danielle's attitude, is that perspective. Um, and it's how we, how we look at, uh, at the world, and whether we tend to view it positively or negatively, whether we're going to, again, depending on the circumstances that we're in, how we're going to react and how we are, uh, are going to respond. Um, we had a guy that I lived with um, over in Vietnam. Uh, it was after the peace agreements had been signed, and we knew that we were going to be going home. Um, and I was standing at the window, window would be a, of our cell, looking out uh, through the bars. It was evening, the other three guys were all lying under their mosquito nets and on the grass mats that we were our, were our mattresses. Uh, and I said, 36 days, and we're out of here. And one of our guys, William Wilson III, we call him World War III, he was over uh, under his mat and he said, yeah, just think, only one-tenth of a year and we're going home. We almost killed him. <laughs> I can stand on my head for 36 days, but a tenth of a year uh, is a whole different deal. Uh, and it is, uh, it is attitude, it is perspective, uh, but at the end of the day, we recognize that that we were going home, that we were very fortunate to be able to, to be headed home. Um, and which brings me to the, the final point uh, along this line that I want to mention, uh, and that is that a sense of humor uh, is absolutely, I think, essential for leadership. Uh, General Eisenhower, who uh, did pretty good at his job, uh, and pretty good at recognizing talent, said that humor, a sense of humor, was an essential ingredient for a leader. Um, and I think that that, uh, as my, my Uncle Gene, Kyle's grandfather, uh, said uh, yesterday when we were together, nothing beats fun. Uh, and I think that every opportunity we have to have a good time, uh, to have a sense of humor, uh, is of great assistance. Uh, when I got shot down uh, and was, I was put in solitary uh, and I just lived alone for about 11 months and about 10 days uh, after I got shot down there was another guy that moved into the cell next to me and we were not allowed to communicate in any way it was against all of the rules well at 3 o'clock one morning um, we ended up whispering back and forth with each other. And I said, uh, who are you? He said, I'm Steve Rudloff. I was uh, uh, in a phantom off in the Constellation. He said, who are you? He said, I'm Joe Kernan. I was in a Vigi uh, off the table. And he said, Jesus, um, your escort lost you guys and you're presumed dead. And it was, it was a much worse day than the day that I got shot down. Uh, we had no idea that our escort had lost us. As a, we had no uh, weapons in the vigilante other than, I had a 38 with flares in it. Uh, but, uh, so we always had an escort that flew with us. It was a phantom. They could keep up with us. Um, and as we had turned to, to go toward our target, they lost visual contact with us. We didn't know that, and I didn't know it until that morning uh, from Steve Rudolph. Uh, and it was a long day uh, thinking about the fact that my family doesn't know that, uh, that I'm alive. They don't know that I'm okay. The Navy, the Department of Defense, doesn't know that I'm alive. Uh, so there's no reason for these guys to keep me alive and all kinds of things that you think about um, in those circumstances. Three months later, uh, 
I'm now living in a group with eight guys. Uh, and families were allowed to send a packet uh, with clothing and foodstuffs and those kinds of things uh, that were non-perishable uh, to the prisoners. And one of the guys on Friday afternoon said, I think there's a packet with your name on it. And I didn't hear anything on Friday, didn't hear anything on Saturday, Sunday rolls around, and I thought, you know, they could just put a bunch of stuff in a box and tell me that it's from home. And decided that if in fact there was a package, there had to be something in there that would tell me that my family knew that I was alive. Uh, so Monday afternoon, I get called in by the guard and they would inventory what you had in the package. Uh, and they would take all of the food and give it to you when they, when they felt like it. But there were some clothing items that you could actually keep. So we inventoried the things in the box. There was no return address on the box. There was nothing uh, that would demonstrate that this was actually from home. Um, he leaves. I take the, the clothing that was in the box, and I head out to the, behind our building where the crapper was and the, the place where we washed our clothes and washed ourselves, and there was a table there. And I threw these things down on the table. Uh, and I had uh, a couple of great friends, guys that I graduated from Notre Dame with, uh, who were in Vietnam. Uh, they were Army. And they were coming home about the time that I was going home. Uh, Billy Keneally, uh, who lives not far from here. Um, his nickname is Wheels. Uh, and Greg Terranova. Uh, and Greg is his nickname is Sam. Um, so I'm out in the back and I had a pair of boxer shorts and I looked at it, there's nothing on a pair, another pair of boxer shorts, nothing. A t-shirt, looked at that. Uh, and there were three handkerchiefs. And I picked up the first handkerchief and I looked at it. Second one I looked at, picked up the third handkerchief and printed in blue ink down in the corner of that handkerchief was these three blowjobs, compliments of Sammy and Wheels. <laughs> and I knew that my family knew that I was alive. Um, and that they apparently thought that I still had a sense of humor. Uh, and that my friends, Wheels and Sammy, were there with my family. Uh, looking after them. Um, and that was the best day uh, that I've ever had, uh, was, was finding that out. Um, and today it means the world to me. I'm actually, for the first time going back to Vietnam, uh, three weeks from Thursday. Uh, and Wheels and his wife, Joni, uh, are going with Maggie and me back to, uh, back to Vietnam. Um, as I, uh, again, got ready for today, I came across something, something that uh, I used to hear when I was a little boy, uh, but I think has a great deal to do with what we're talking about today. Uh, and it's in a, in a poem by Rudyard Kepler. It's called If. Uh, and a couple of the lines from that poem are, uh, if you can keep your head while all those around you are losing theirs. If you can meet uh, with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And, which is more, You'll be a man, my son. And it, it, is, it is perspective. It, it is what you learn. It is how you implement what you learn. Uh, it, it is the kinds of opportunities that present themselves. Uh, it was mentioned this morning uh, about being steady. Uh, and when I was running for, actually when I was going moving to Indianapolis, uh, I was looking for a press secretary, and 
guy from one of the TV stations called me and he said, there's this woman that you ought to look at, look at. she's a production assistant at the local TV station. Um, and as things get crazier, she becomes calmer. Uh, her name is Tina Dennis, and I hired Tina, uh, and he was absolutely, absolutely right. Uh, it, it, it is how under pressure do we react, how have we taken the life lessons that we've got and apply them uh, in order to be able to deal with those things that are certainly going to happen to us. Uh, the, the crises that will visit themselves upon us uh, and make sure that we are in the strongest position possible uh, to be able to deal with them uh, and deal with them effectively. Um, with that, I'd like to just open it up for any questions. Uh, or any comments that you might have. And I guess we ask you to move up to these microphones. Uh, don't be don't be bashful. Um, uh, I would. The first one's always the toughest one uh, to ask. Um, there was some discussion this morning while everyone's making their way up to the microphone. Uh, there was some discussion this morning uh, about your your team. Uh, and I think that if you look at it, you're going to have, because of the positions that you will hold, you're going to have people that work for you. Uh, I would advise you not to use that term, not to talk about the fact that you are the leader. Uh, there are people you work with, but nonetheless, there will be people that, that will report to you. Um, and there is no job that is tougher from a leadership standpoint, than working with people uh, and helping to give them guidance, give them goals, uh, evaluating their performance. Um, and because of uh, all of the different challenges, and we talked this morning about many of them that have to do uh, with the particular circumstances that you were in, but there is another responsibility, and that has to do with the everyday kinds of challenges that your employees that those that report to you, those that you are responsible for, uh, will have. Um, and you have a responsibility to be on top of that. Um, and it can be, it, it's everything from uh, financial challenges that a family uh, is facing, uh, which unfortunately is not uncommon um, in, in, uh, in the armed service. Um, it is substance abuse. It is child uh, that is sick. Um, it is how they juggle uh, being able to get their kids to school and uh, the spouse uh, is working uh, an outside job in order to be able to make ends meet. And all of those things, some of which might be uh, applicable uh, or be the right circumstance for the employee assistance program, uh, others of which you can help someone, someone to work through. But if you want to have and to keep good people, um, you have to care about them, uh, care for them. Uh, it, it is absolutely fundamental uh, for you to do. Uh, and it will, make you, uh, it will make you a better person uh, in addition to a better leader and will have tremendous positive impact on the lives of those that you serve with uh, and those that you cannot get the job done uh, without. Are there any other questions? <laughs> um, let me just uh, uh, just touch a little bit on something um, that I think becomes more and more appropriate every day. And that is, we talked again this morning, there was discussion about communication and how essential communication is within the organization or with those that you were working for. But increasingly, the responsibilities that you will have in dealing with external communication uh, are something that um, you need to take into consideration uh, and I would argue that you need to practice. With 24-7 news, uh, and I think that most of 24-7 news, uh, right, left, or indifferent, uh, that we have today is anything but news, I think it's entertainment, uh, but the fact is that with the kinds of communications that are in place today, when I got shot down, 
Uh, my family didn't know anything uh, for uh, about 12 hours. And that actually was because of a mistake uh, that was made uh, in making contact incorrectly that had nothing to do with the baby structure. Uh, but uh, it was going to be a 24-hour difference between when I got shot down and when my family was uh, Today, uh, we know immediately uh, when we've lost an aircraft, when there's an accident, uh, how many men and women uh, lost their lives in, in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, and the need to be prepared to speak to those circumstances that you might find yourself in, uh, to be a spokesperson. Uh, the ability to do so effectively, uh, I think, is critical. And at the top of the list is to be prepared. The more you know about your subject matter, the better you are going to be able to deal with it. The better you're going to be able to answer questions. Um, if you can buy time uh, before you have an interview with a print reporter or with a news, uh, uh, an electronic uh, reporter, uh, the more time you have to be able to uh, have someone, if not you, say, hey, listen, what's the, what's the interview about? What's the subject matter? What do you want to talk about? so that, again, you can be as prepared uh, as possible. You need to know exactly what point it is that you want to make, uh, what it is that you want to say, what, uh, what you want to get across. And view it as an opportunity and not something that you dread. Uh, because if it's something that you dread and, and you're uncomfortable and you're sweating and you're not, uh, you're not on top of your game, the reporter will smell. Uh, and uh, reporting is different today uh, than it was when I first got involved in, uh, in politics, uh, where you've got people that uh, are not so much focused on what might be good news, or not focused on telling all of the story that you want to tell, but instead are focused on what is negative. Um, what's going to help me get the next job in the bigger TV market? What's going to help me uh, get to NBC or, or to Fox? Uh, how do I get there? It's not by telling the feel-good stories uh, as much as it is about telling the things that have gone wrong. Um, and they will come after you. You should be helpful. Uh, don't be adversarial. Um, does everyone know what radio discipline is? Uh, radio discipline is if you're on final approach uh, to the carrier, um, you don't want to know what the LSO had for breakfast. You want him to be telling you exactly what information you need in order to be able to land successfully on the carrier. Anything else is extraneous. Uh, I think uh, one of my rules is that radio discipline should be applied to emails, to voicemail, to text messages. Uh, get it across. Uh, tell me what it is that you want. Make your point, uh, and then get off the radio. Uh, and there is great danger um, in going beyond what you originally expected to talk about or what you were prepared to talk about um, and getting into other things and elaborating. Um, if anybody saw Mark McGuire a couple of weeks ago, um, would have done himself a great service um, if he had done what he did a few weeks ago, five years ago. Um, but he had a prepared statement. Ben was very good, um, and he accepted responsibility uh, for what he did. He then ended up uh, on talk shows uh, on ESPN, uh, mostly sports talk, um, all over the, the country. And it was torture uh, to watch him uh, as he began to unravel and talk about the fact that, well, it was really his lawyers who made him not talk to Congress. Um, that, yes, he had taken steroids, but they were for his health um, and his recovery time. Uh, yes, he used steroids, but they didn't really have anything to do with him getting more home runs. Um, yes, uh, he would have hit uh, the same number of home runs, uh, whether he took steroids or not, and he kept talking. Uh, and he got off message, uh, and unfortunately, I think, undid any of the, much of the goodwill um, that he had mustered with his, uh, his original state. I like Mark Lamar, uh, 
but it was very hard to watch, uh, to watch him do that, and it's a trap that reporters will get you into uh, in any way that they can. Uh, that's the story that they want. Um, and there's great danger there in not enforcing radio discipline um, and going on and talking. I have a couple of gentlemen here that uh, have a question. Alice? My name is Anthony My name is Anthony Miller. I'm from the American University in Washington, D.C. Um, you spoke a lot to being that steady, being that rock for others to rely upon in a situation of crisis. You also talked about uh, being able to work with people, with people that you know you, you work over but you work with um, at the same time. And you also talked about communication. Now being the rock, being that steady in a time of crisis is, is a great discipline for yourself. But can you speak to how you can communicate that to the people that you're working with? How you can empower them to have that same kind of discipline? Uh, the question is how do you communicate um, with the people that you are working with uh, effectively in order to be able to get the job done? I think you keep people in the loop. Um, you trust them, uh, so you're going to share information with them. Uh, by bringing them in, you tell them that you trust them. You tell them that uh, you want them to make decisions, uh, that you want them to take initiative, uh, that here is here's why we, were, we are here. Uh, and here's the structure within which we are going to work. But, uh, again, it depends on the circumstance, but you still want your people to know uh, that whether it's a life and death situation or whatever the circumstances are, that you expect them to demonstrate the same kind of leadership that they have that got them on the team in the first place. Uh, Afternoon, sir. Mr. the first class finish. I'm a senior here at the Academy. Uh, we spoke earlier during the panel in the previous speech about uh, making mistakes and how important it is to explain um, to those uh, who you work with um, when you do and, and to own up to that um, and how important that can be. Um, it's a little bit different uh, when you're in the public light and you're making decisions, whether they be right or wrong, everyone has an opinion. And I think no matter what decision you make, there's always a group or an organization out there that is going to tell you you made the wrong one. And you have to stand up for that, not only on TV, but also with your with your folks. So how do you deal with that um, in most situations, when you think you've done the right thing, when maybe you have made a mistake? And especially, how do you deal with that with the public um, of the nature that, that America is today? Um, I, I think that, uh, that well, every decision that I ever made when I was in elective office, pissed somebody off. Uh, it was, when I was mayor, it was uh, the trash didn't get picked up. Uh, the 911 responders didn't show up on time. Uh, uh, the, the fact is that I think too often uh, people believe that the right thing to do is to just go on offense and hope that that will will smother uh, any kind of negative feelings that somebody might have about a decision that was made and try to get past it that way. Um, and I think that those in public life very often don't say, uh, I made a mistake, uh, I screwed up, my fault. Uh, and after all, as a chief executive, um, that's where it goes. Uh, you have an idea with with the kinds of services that are delivered uh, in local and state government and in federal government. Uh, decisions that go wrong are the ones that get magnified. Um, and it is necessary, I think, sometimes, and I've done it, uh, to say, you know, I've had a chance to look at this. Um, we did make, uh, I did make uh, a mistake, but here's what we've done to rectify uh, that mistake. Uh, it's, it's not a matter of whether you're going to make mistakes or not. That's a given. Um, you are going to make mistakes. The question becomes, what are you going to do about it? Um, and what have you learned from it? And um, recognizing that I can't do anything about what happened yesterday, uh, but I do have control over what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, and that is what gives you the ability to be able to talk about those things 
that you either learn more information about uh, that that blew up on you uh, because of some unexpected reason, whether you should have anticipated it or not. Uh, but I think that people uh, find it uh, refreshing when people say, you know, I didn't, uh, I did the wrong thing. Uh, again, I'll go back to football. Brett Farr last night was terrific. Uh, he just opened himself up and, and said, obviously, he was disappointed. He didn't play as well as he would have liked, and he would have liked to have that pass over the middle, uh, been able to take that back, and, uh, and he took responsibility. And, uh, and with that, I think, comes, comes respect, and comes the kind of leadership that we, that we hope we have. Sir, can I ask a quick follow-up sure. question? Um, we talked earlier about how something about 69% of the public doesn't trust the politicians. Uh, do you think that it would help restore some of the faith that seems to have been lost in the public if more and more of our public leaders would, you know, stand true to that and, and uh, you know, come clean if something goes wrong? I, I, I do. I, I mean, I think that's a factor. I'll tell you what, um, one of the things that scares me to death today uh, is the accountability of what we, we read and we see. Uh, the demise of newspapers uh, across the country where there's editorial and content oversight uh, for newspapers. Uh, today, all you need to be able to create a story is a computer. Uh, and the blogs and, and some of the things that we read today uh, are unconscionable uh, about public servants, about uh, decisions that have been made. Uh, they're not factual. Uh, they are very biased. And there is no oversight. And so more and more people are being exposed to those kinds of things that if you, uh, if you say it enough uh, and say it with enough conviction, people are going to believe it. Uh, and I think that it's so incumbent upon all of us as citizens uh, to be as well informed as we can be and understand that there are typically uh, there are two sides to every story, um, and that you've got to be comfortable with the source of your information. Uh, and it's getting more and more difficult to separate the wheat from the chaff. Um, who can I trust? Uh, who's just sitting in, uh, in a room with no windows, uh, making stuff up uh, about whatever it is, whether it's who the new football coach at Notre Dame is going to be, uh, what's in a health care bill, or what's happening in, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan. Good afternoon, sir. I'm the shit and class team the Tran from the University of Southern California. As a, <laughs> as a, as a Vietnamese American, I'd like to thank you personally for your service in the Vietnam War. Uh, my question is, this morning, one of the other speakers was talking about how uh, crisis is an opportunity for a leadership team to change your organization. In your political and military career, have you ever faced a crisis that gave you an opportunity to institute change? Um, when I was lieutenant governor, and it was September 8th of 2003, uh, and Governor Bannon had a stroke, and we actually happened to be together in Chicago, which was very unusual for us to be together uh, outside the state at the same time, but it was the Japan Midwest U.S. Economic Conference. Um, and so we were both there. Uh, had trouble getting government waiting, getting government in and up. Uh, and it turned out that he had a stroke. Um, and I got into the room uh, about 60 seconds after uh, they had broken down the door uh, to his room and knew that the world had changed. I didn't know to what degree. Uh, but I went to the hospital with him, rode the ambulance with him, went to the hospital, and then left uh, to go back to the airport. And Mrs. O'Bannon came up on a helicopter and I briefed her on what was going on. And then I went back to Indianapolis. And over the course of the next five days, um, began to, to pull together uh, and began immediately went over a five-day period. People that I trusted, people that I knew would tell me the truth, 
people that I knew had my interest at heart, but also the interest of Governor O'Bannon and the state. Uh, and we determined that we were treading on ground that had not, was not covered in the Indiana Constitution, uh, where the governor was incapacitated. Uh, and I was there as the, basically the acting governor. Uh, and how did we work our way through that minefield and do so very deliberately? Um, and it was an extraordinary experience for me because we were able to bring together leadership from both parties in both houses of our legislature uh, to sit down uh, and walk through a process with the Chief Justice uh, and other members of the Supreme Court uh, in Indiana uh, and make decisions that uh, were responsible, that were consistent with letting people know that no, there was, there was not a void of leadership, uh, but that Governor Bannon was still the governor, uh, and uh, to do that in such a way that um, we would, would not alienate, um, and hopefully we'd get people to rally around. And it was an extraordinary time because of the virtually unanimous feelings in the state uh, of concern for our government, and at the same time, uh, the, the way that we walked through the transition uh, together. Uh, it was then that Friday, that Saturday, five days later, the governor passed away and I, uh, and I took the oath of office um, and made changes. Uh, I made changes in the governor's office, brought in people that, uh, again, that I had worked with before, that uh, I felt very comfortable with, um, and set our own course, uh, albeit one that was abbreviated the 16 months that I was governor, uh, but was able to in that in that time period be able to do some things that I uh, that I think made a difference for the state. I'll just tell you a quick story, uh, and again, it comes back to the attitude and how you approach things. Uh, I had decided prior to Governor Van and passing away that I was not going to run for governor. Uh, that when my term as lieutenant governor was up, I was going to go back home, back to South Bend. Uh, him passing away changed uh, everything, kind of stood it all on its head. I decided to run. Uh, and he had a lot of great help from some of the people that are here today. My sisters uh, came out and uh, participated well, on election night. Um, very running against a very good candidate. Uh, and on election night, as the returns were coming in, about three, three hours after the polls closed, and uh, I went down to the room where the family was gathered. And uh, it was my dad, uh, all seven of my sisters, my brother, some very close friends, nieces and nephews. Uh, and I said, listen, what you're seeing on television looks like what's going to happen. Uh, it doesn't look good. I'm going to hear very shortly call the other guy. I'm going to congratulate him. Uh, I'm going to tell him that I look forward to working with him during the transition uh, to make it as smooth as possible. Um, and then uh, we're going to go downstairs because we've got a thousand people in the ballroom uh, that have worked very hard over the last year, uh, and we're going to we're going to have a party. And so it was pretty somber uh, in uh, in the room and. Everybody kind of started to break up. But my brother, Terry, uh, 16 years younger than I am, and Terry came up and he, he put his arm around me and kind of took me over into the corner. And he said, so Joey, does this mean we're not going to get tickets for the final four? <laughs> so uh, it was a good way uh, to prepare myself for calling Governor Daniels. Uh, and for moving on to a party and, uh, and again, not worrying about what might have been, uh, but instead, uh, what was. Let me, uh, let me just close uh, here with, a, uh, with two very brief stories. Uh, one was that when, to give you a little feel for the kind of outfit the kind of organization that you were part of. Uh, and I know we've got some, some Army and some Air Force and, uh, here, uh, and it applies across the board. Um, 
that from the moment that I got shot down, the Navy began to work uh, and worked for the next 11 months uh, with my family and took extraordinary care uh, of them, uh, my mom and dad, uh, of Mandy, who was not my wife at the time, but, uh, but is today, um, and looked out for them while at the same time they were looking out for me. Uh, I had given a car to this buddy of mine, uh, because I was going to be gone for a year, turned out to be a little longer than I, uh, than I thought it was going to. But I had given him a car. Uh, and very shortly after I got shot down, uh, there was a chief petty officer that knocked on Riley O'Connor's door, and he said, uh, I need the keys for Joe's car. Uh, and the Navy did not want somebody out there driving a car that was mine that might be somehow tied back to me that would cause me uh, liability issues. Um, and, and worked with my family uh, every day with the our casualty assistance calls officer, the CACO, and, um, uh, and it's a debt that I will never, uh, that I will never be able to repay. S second uh, is, after I got home, and um, it's about six months after I got home, and I was in South Bend, we were at Mandy's house, her folks' house, and we were having a party after a football game. Uh, we must not have played baby uh, that day. Um, but we were at a party, and a bunch of guys that I went to school with were there, graduated. Um, and I had, uh, I had all the information about friends, people that I served with, and uh, who came home from Vietnam and who did. Um, and at this party, uh, one of the guys said, well, you know, Mike McCormick uh, is still missing. I said, what? Uh, and Mike McCormick was a classmate from Notre Dame. He, uh, he and I bumped into each other half a dozen times as we were working our way through flight school. And, uh, and he was an A6 driver. Uh, and I said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, Mike, Mike got shot down, and he's, uh, he's missing. And I didn't know. Uh, and again, six months after I got home, and I went out, it was dark, and I went out in the front yard of uh, Mandy's folks' house, and I cried. Uh, because I had, I had put the package together of all of the, my losses from Vietnam, and here it got ripped open in this great, wonderful guy. Uh, he and Al Clark, who was his BM, uh, on the 10th of January of 1973, 17 days before the peace agreements were signed, uh, took off 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they were on a mission up in the Vin, the area around Vin. It's about halfway uh, up the coast of North Vietnam, uh, and they didn't come back. And at that time, they were listed as MIA. They ended up being MIA for about two years. They finally reclassified as KIA. The remains had never been recovered. Um, in the summer of 2003, because of the efforts of our armed services and our government. Uh, Al and Mike uh, were found in a heavily wooded area uh, near Bend, uh, in North Vietnam. Uh, way off the beaten path, but uh, they found the, the aircraft and they found their room. Uh, and they came back home. And on the 10th of January of 2004, 31 years to the day um, after they had gone missing, uh, they were buried in Arlington. And there were 29 of us from Notre Dame that were there. There were another 30 guys uh, from their squadrons 
from SWAT on the day. Um, both of their wives and both of their sons uh, were there as well. Both wives have been since had since remarried. Um, and we were in the chapel at, at Arlington. And the wheeled in the, the casket. And there was only one cast. And I didn't know that. Uh, and it, as we walked, the service inside the chapel was completed. We walked uh, down to the area where they were going to be buried. Um, and in that area, it was all flight crews. It was one grade and uh, was flight crews crew of six from a B-17 in World War II, uh, flight crews from uh, flying different aircraft uh, at different times. And the, the rationale uh, is that they, they lived together, uh, they flew together, they fought together, uh, they died together, uh, and they would spend eternity and for 31 years, uh, we, as a country, as a community, uh, didn't forget them and gave them uh, a proper way uh, to be remembered uh, and to be, to be together. And for me, uh, it says it all uh, about who we are, words and all, uh, who we are, uh, and how we are different, and we should all be very good about it. So, go Navy, uh, and thank you all very much. It's been great being with you today.